Hello and welcome to Talking Papers, the podcast where we talk about papers and let the papers do the talking. Today we will be talking about the paper Learning Smooth Neural Functions via Lipschitz Regularizations, published at Seagraph 2022. I'm happy to host Derek Liu, the first author of the paper, to talk about it. Hello, Derek, and welcome to the podcast. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Isaac, for the invitation. It is really my honor to participate in this that kind of great series of spreading knowledge. And also, most importantly, thank you, everyone, for, for kind of joining with, me, with us and then, and then also listen to this paper. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is Derek, and I'm my final year PhD student at the University of Toronto. And actually, after graduating, I'll be joining Roblox Research as a research scientist. And who are the co-authors of this paper? Yeah, so this is actually, this paper comes from uh, the, the internship I did at NVIDIA. So this is, paper is actually collaborates with a bunch of great people at NVIDIA, including uh, Francis Williams, uh, Sanya Fiddler, and Lord Litany. And this paper also involves my advisor, Alec Jacobson. Okay, so let's dive in. So in a TLDR kind of format, tell us, what is this paper about? So this paper is actually very, very simple. We just try to propose a te technique that you can help you to learn very smooth function uh, parameterized by neural networks. So for example, if you want to train some neural network and you want the result function to be smooth, and our approach is the solution to this problem. So let's dive into the introduction. So what problem is this paper addressing? So this paper is actually the, the key technical idea of this approach is to try to figure out a way to kind of measure how smooth uh, your neural network is. And we encourage a method, we propose a method to kind of encourage your solution to be very smooth. And the reason we want to work on this is you can, there are many, many reasons that a people or a person wants some smooth solution. For example, in graphics, a lot of cases when we want to do, for example, interpolating between two shapes, you want the interpolation to be something that's meaningful, to be something that's smooth. You won't you don't want like the interpolation between two shapes going to be crazy. So typically people will in, try to encourage a smooth interpolation between the shape. And another reason is probably in the machine learning context, because there are a lot of people are using very large and very deep neural network to train, uh, to solve your problem, basically. And a lot of empirical results shows that using very large machine learning model actually gets you better result. But if you don't have enough data, then you may encounter the problem of, of overfitting, where your function going crazy between two data points. So in this case, this kind of smoothness uh, measure or smoothness regularization can help you to kind of get rid of this overfitting problem. Okay, and what are the main challenges here? Oh, the main challenge is, is actually, um, you sh I, can, I can talk about the change I faced uh, during this project. Basically, I come from the, like a graphics background, like doing like, uh, like a geometry processing and like not involved machine learning at the very beginning. And typically when we want to do some geometry processing and we want to measure smoothness, we usually will measure, for example, if you have a function and you can take the gradient, you can look at the slope of this function. And a very classic way of measuring smoothness is to, let's say, for example, you take the square of the slope. If the slope is very large, then the function is not smooth. If the, function, the slope is very small, then your function is smooth. There's a, this is like a very classic way of, of like measuring smoothness in geometry processing. And the most difficult thing is that if we want to incorporate this knowledge to train a machine model and to make it smooth, this is actually something that's very difficult to achieve, at least in my personal experience, because in order to, for example, you can imagine a 1D function and you want to measure like the slope, you have to query say, okay, I want to, I want to look at the slope at, for example, x equals to one. You want to look at the slope at x equals two, and you need to sample many, many, many x in order to uh, get many, many slopes. And you want to make sure all the slopes are going to be small. But in the context of neural networks, this requires very large amount of sample points in your neural network space. And this is actually intractable because basically your train data, let's say your train data always lies in uh, X between zero and one, and you sample many points between there. And there's no guarantee that your function will be smooth beyond, for example, X equals to one. So the biggest challenge is that we actually, when I try to implement a bunch of a smoothest measure in geometry processing to the neural network setup, they do not work very well. Basically, they 
can't generalize beyond the train data. So what we end up using is basically a measure uh, called the Lipschitz constant, which we can talk about it later, uh, is that we basically focus on a measure that can generalize across uh, all the uh, input uh, data. We don't have, we put no assumption on what's the range of the input. We basically try to encourage just the neural network to be smooth everywhere without, need, without sampling the input space, basically. Yeah, this brings us right into the contribution. So what is the main contribution of this paper? Yeah, so so as we mentioned that this the, we, we focus on something called the Lipschitz constant, and just for people who are may not familiar with this concept, this Lipschitz constant is nothing but like the maximum bound of your magnitude of a slope. For example, if you have a one D function, you can measure the slope, and if you if you take a slope and then measure the magnitude of the slope, and and the maximum value of all the possible slopes in this function is called a Lipschitz bound. And people typically assign a Lipschitz constant to represent like the, how large the bound is. And the beauty of this work is that we can we actually notice that like actually not what we observe actually it is very well known in the machine learning community that the Lipschitz constant is something that can be analyzed by looking at the weights of the network. So you don't need to, you don't need any input just by looking at the weights. You can kind of measure what would be the, uh, what's the upper bound of the Lipschitz constant of the network. And the key idea of our approach is basically propose a way to penalize Lipschitz, Lipschitz constant, which equivalents to make sure uh, this neural network function is going to be smooth. So the one, one of the key contribution is to propose a Lipschitz regularization to encourage the Lipschitz constant to be small, which encourages the network to be smooth. And the second contribution is a, is a small architectural change to the neural network so that you can actually effectively make this network uh, aware of this uh, low Lipschitz constant. Based on the contribution basically R2, one's a Lipschitz regularization, and the second term is a small change in the architecture to incorporate the Lipschitz constant. Okay, so before we dive in deeper, let's talk a little bit about related works. So if you had to name one or two papers or even a blog post that were instrumental in writing this paper, which ones would those be? I, I would say uh, there are two uh, lines of work that are that I, I will rec in strongly recommend all the uh, listeners to or all the audience to to take a look. The first part is the research on something called the neural fields. Uh, neural fields is basically like a... You can think of it as a new terminology to describe some fields, volumetric function, continuous volumetric function parameterized by neural network. So for example, something like deep SDF or occupancy networks that basically are very like important works on how to use neural network to represent shapes. And this representation is called the neural fields. And because this is the main representation we work on, I'll definitely encourage people to take a look at these kind of neural fields work. And the second lines of work that uh, I think that's more relevant to the technical detail of this paper is on the parts about like Lipschitz, Lipschitz normalization or Lipschitz constant of new network. And personally, I will strongly encourage you all to take a look at a paper called the sorting out Lipschitz functions, I think. It's by Jam and James and Professor Roger Gross from the University of Toronto. And the reason I strongly recommend this paper is because personally, this paper is the paper that got me interested into this topic. And th their main contribution is not related to ours specifically because they are proposing a activation function that could control the Lipschitz bound of the network. But there are actually other, other than this main contribution, they have a, a lot of very good introductory content about Lipschitz properties about the neural network. Basically, this paper is basically what taught me a lot about knowing about Lipschitz constant of the network and how to compute it and what's the variance and what's the importance of this concept. So I'll definitely encourage you all to take a look at this sorting out Lipschitz fun functions. Cool, I'll make sure to check it out myself. I didn't know that one. Okay, now let's dive into the approach. So what is the key idea and innovation of this paper and how did you do it? So as we mentioned, like this, the key idea is to make sure the Lipschitz constant of the network is smooth. So basically the key invention is that we propose a new regular regularization. You can think of it as just a new term you can add on top to your loss function. And once you add this new term, this new term will basically measure the, well, this this term basically goes very large. If you have a very large 
ellipsis bound neural network. Basically, this term is large if your function is non-smooth. And this function is very small if function is smooth, has lower ellipsis bound. So basically, like the key ingredient is this ellipsis term that you can take your weight matrices from your multi-layer perceptron and you can compute this ellipsis um, this Lipschitz regularization, a Lipschitz term, and then you can add it as a regularization to your loss function, and your method will be smooth. But as I mentioned, this is this is a term that takes your weight matrices and outputs some value, right? And you also want to incorporate this the computed Lipschitz constant back to your architecture. So another small modification you want to do is that when you do simple the forward pass of your network, you need to kind of normalize or scale down your weights according to the Lipschitz constant. So basically combining this uh, regularization term and this weight normalization term, which can be implemented by, I, in a few lines of code, then you'll be able to train a neural network with very smooth uh, result. Okay, so for, for the novice listener that, that didn't train DeepSDF or any neural field function, so I think it's important to like establish a baseline, right? So in all of these papers, uh, or most of these papers, the input is like an XYZ coordinate plus a code representing the shape, right? Then you have this MLP that um, processes this input and the output is this sine distance function, right? The distance of that point to the surface, okay? And basically in, in like the standard case, before your paper existed, these weights inside this MLP could be whatever works, right? You have the, lo the reconstruction loss, sometimes you have additional losses, these weights could get whatever. And now with what you're proposing, what that does, right? It, it takes those weights, and what does it do to them? So you you take those weights, and you fir you first have a, we introduce additional parameter called but that's called like Lipschitz constant for now. So we introduce another parameter where you will uh, you can think of as normalizing your weights. Basically, it will scale down some rows in your weight matrix. So basically, there's a constant that makes your weights to be smaller. So that's the first thing we do. In this in this technique, and this once you make this and and there's a so without going through the details, making the way smaller will make your neural network function to be to be smoother. So that's just like measured by the Lipschitz count, so the Lipschitz bound. So basically, the first thing we do is that take those weights, we will we will scale it down to be smaller, and then this Lipschitz per layer Lipschitz constant, when we will we will have a term that basically. Uh, take those per layer Lipschitz constant and output a value. If this Lipschitz constant are large, then this value is going to be high. And if this if this if these Lipschitz constant are small, then then this uh, term will be small. And that's basically a term that measures the smoothness of your function. So right. So because in in the tr if you want to train a network, we define a loss function and want to minimize this loss function, right? So. If you want to minimize this loss function, then you will try to encourage all the Lipschitz constant to be small. And if, if Lipschitz constants are small, then in the normalization, it will make this weight even smaller. So that's basically the way we try to make this neural network smooth or make this deep SDF smooth by making the weight smaller. Right. So this is really interesting, right? So you take the, the mm -hmm. traditional MLP that everybody used, but instead of allowing it to get any solution possible, which which is basically what it does, right? It minimizes the loss. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter what those weights are. And now we're saying, no, 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 it matters what those weights are. I want them to provide a solution that is actually, actually smooth. So you're saying, okay, I'm going to limit the maximum value of those weights to be very, very small using this Lipschitz constant, which I'm going to then penalize in the loss, right? So you're guiding those weights to, to achieve a very smooth solution. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah, I think another thing that I can add to that is because usually uh, we are usually when we use neural network, we are usually considering the over parameterized case, which means that there are many, many sets of weights that can give us, for example, identical solutions. And so basically this method you can think of as a way to filter out some uh, other combination of weights that are very, very large. And when we want to, we prefer the ones that with smaller values in the weight values. And this, this set with smaller weights usually gives us small, smoother solutions. And it's only four lines of code. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We actually, we, we start with like, not definitely not four lines of code. We start with something that's very large, even involving some computing gradient and auto div and everything. But, 
like my personal my personal preference is to start by making it work, and once it's work, but it's complicated, and, and I will try my best to simplify it, simplify it to get rid of redundant stuff, and after. At the end of the day, this could be implementing four lines of code. So I, that's that's actually that's a part I, my my favorite part because everyone can implement it. We even provide the source code in the main text of a code, a uh, main, main text of a paper. I saw. I even implemented it myself. <laughs> okay, but but let's get back. I guess this kind of starts to to drip into the results section. But I'll, let me mm-hmm. challenge you with the questions. Aren't there any other ways to make the solution smooth as well? Yes, I think there are a lot of ways that we can make it smooth. And for for example, what I think the the very very obvious way is probably just borrow because when I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of Lipschitz normalization work in the machine learning settings, and there are a lot of those papers that. What they do, just just briefly summarize what they do is that they will set a bound, they will manually define, say that, okay, I want the Lipschitz constant to be something like one, and then they constrain the weights to not having Lipschitz constant more than one. And this, if you use this approach, you can definitely make your solution smooth, but in the context of, for example, what we want to do is shape interpolation, it's very, very hard to actually guess what is the optimal Lipschitz constant. Because if you want to set it to be very, very small, then the functions, the neural network is probably too smooth to fit a complex function. But if it's too large, then it is not smooth at all. So, so one way, if you want to make sure your solution is smooth, you can definitely use this kind of Lipschitz normalization. If you search this term, I believe, or spectral normalization, you will find a lot of papers on it. But this is, this something is, this is very hard to control. Basically, personally, I also needed try like many, many hyperparameters to find out one that works okay, but it, it still not works optimally compared to the, the, the soft version of Lipschitz normalization. And there are also other ways that you can do it. For example, like the old ways, you can penalize the L2 norm of your weights or I don't know, L1 norm or some other norms of your weights. This, this, I think, or this, I forgot the name of that, but basically penalize the L2 norm of your weights, you can also encourage the weights to be smooth. But we, we, in my experiment, I found that these kind of methods can make the weights small for sure. But it's not necessary making the solution to be, to be um, smooth measured by our Lipschitz constant. Basically, we, I think in one of the experiments we tried is that we use this kind of L2 regularization and then when we can make sure the weight value to be is small in the under well L2 sense, but the Lipschitz bound of the network can still go up, which means that this network can still be non-smooth, even if the weight, the summation of the weights are smooth, are small. So I think there are a lot of many, many ways we can do it. And here are just like two examples that is common, commonly used in machine learning fields. Okay, so now now let's dive into to some of the results. So, how do you even evaluate the performance of this kind of thing? Yeah, I think um, partly it's because we are kind of summing to this graph. So, a lot of the majority of our evaluations are very uh, qualitative. Basically, we, the toy example we try is that we just take randomly pick two shapes, like a torus and a double torus, and what we do is that we train the deep SDF model to fit a one torus, let's say the latent code to be just a scalar latent code, latent code is zero. And we can say that, okay, we train the same SDF, but when latent code goes to one, it needs to become a, a double torus. So we have a same network. When latent code is zero, it's a torus, and latent code is one, it's a double torus. And we just s- smoothly change T, like the latent code T from zero to one, and we can interpolate this a torus to double torus, right? And a basic qualitative example is that we just do this interpolation to see what the result look like. And we can see a lot of paper, figures in the paper that if we use Lipschitz regularization, the interpolation is going to be smooth. So like that's one kind of uh, qualitative visualization, but we also try a lot of other qual- quantitative things. For example, we can use um, standard way of measuring smoothness that I mentioned very beginning, like we can take the slope of the function and take the square of that slope and we can measure the value of that slope, right? And we can also, so we train, basically train like under a normal, a traditional setup and our lips just set up and then we can use this uh, standard way of measuring smoothness uh, to compute a value. And basically this also shows that our method can encourage smooth solutions. So yeah, and there was other other experiment. For example, we also try 
another application, which is called a test timeization, which is, I think it's very popular in terms of like in the reconstruction field where, where because we remember that the deep SDF, we take a coordinates and the codes of the shape and output some sine distance function of the shape, right? And basically different codes represent different shapes. And so in a lot of reconstruction paper, they will try to do uh, the optimization on the code. So after your training, your network is fixed, but they want to figure out what's the optimal code so that it, for example, better reconstruct a point cloud. And and but usually if your network is not smooth, and this optimization of figuring out the best latent code will usually be something that's not what you will expect because the 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 kind of the network function can go crazy, and those crazy function may may luckily be a very good fit for your point cloud and it will stop here. But if you're kind of, if you're cold, your latent, if your network is smooth and the move from the latent code is also going to be smooth, it will usually give you a better result if you do this kind of a cold optimization. Yeah. So this is the, you're talking about the auto decoder kind of setup. Yeah. So if, if the yeah, space is yeah. that smooth, you may end up in at, at a point that's right between two shapes that were in the training set. And that's basically nothing there, even though that, that, minimizes the loss on the input point clouds, but what you actually want it to yeah. be is is the actual shape that it represents, which is a really challenging task. And this is one of the, yeah. the really nice results in, in the paper. Another another nice result that I personally really liked is how you showed like in the 2D case, how when you use your Lipschitz MLP uh, constraints, then you get between two shapes, you get this very almost linear, I want to say, change in the shape. While if you don't use it, then everything is kind of squished down to the first, you know, about a third of the way between them. That was a really nice uh, result to show. Yeah, I think that's basically the, the outcome of, of using traditional measure where we only choose a bunch of sample points and then penalize the, the slope. But but on the region we don't have samples, the network can go crazy. The network is very, very powerful in terms of feeding something crazy, even in a small region of, of the input. So I think that's the reason why traditional measure uh, may not be that suitable for, for getting smooth solution. Yeah, you had another interesting experiment where you were looking at adversarial attacks. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is actually tied to another class of related work because actually the reason why uh, Lipschitz uh, network is very popular in machine learning field is because in machine learning we there's a concept called the adversarial examples. So just a brief background for people who don't who first time hearing this word is that if you let's say if I have a okay if I train a very very powerful image classifier on I know a large image data set and if I give you like a, I know a monkey will output 99% monkey if I give you a dog you will output like 90% is a dog so it will very very good image classifier. But it is very well known that if you use this kind of state of the image classifier, it will suffer from an effect called the adversarial examples. Basically, if I give you like the famous example, if I give you a panda, and the, the network will tell you it's a, I don't know, 89% is a panda, for example. But if I add a little bit of noise to this image, where the noise is so small that the human eyes can't tell the difference, but this noise, may trigger the machine learning model to have very crazy misclassification, for example, turning a pen die to, I don't know, something else like a dinosaur or something. And so basically, this effect that a state of the art network is vulnerable to this kind of very, very tiny perturbation is has a lot of like security uh, implications because it, it, it may indicate that even if some noise in the image, it may trigger crazy misclassification, this is not a very good thing if you really want to deploy machine learning model to, to real world. And the, the use case of Lipschitz constant here is that actually there are a lot of research study how to make this kind of large model robust to this kind of perturbations. And one of the results showed that like making sure the network has small Lipschitz constant is actually very useful to be robust to this kind of perturbation. So in this work, we also demonstrate, we just try to kind of uh, demonstrate that our case can encourage small Lipschitz constant. And then by showing showing kind of reinvent the wheel, or not necessarily reinvent the wheel, but basically uh, verify like the other, other 
uh, people doing the research about showing small lips Wisconsin is robust network. And we also show the same thing that if we train a network with smooth MLP with small lips Wisconsin, we can also robust be robust to this kind of adversarial perturbations. Yeah, th- that's a really nice application to show where where these kind of you know smooth solutions are are also beneficial not only you know just for the visualization and graphics kind of applications but also in this robustness to adversarial attacks so um in which cases does the method fail can it fail does it have failure modes yeah yes yes i think there are uh, it actually contradict to another popular line of work in machine learning field which is called like the uh, positional encoding or a lot of those uh, like sine or cosine activation function because I was so so just a little bit of background is that typically in, in the deep SDF we may have input like XYZ coordinate to the to the network and there are a lot of paper a lot of uh, people discover that if you instead of inputting X for example X coordinate to the network you input sine X and sine I know two X sine thirty X basically having some periodic function with high frequency times this coordinate, basically this is called like the positional encoding or frequency encoding. There are many names for that. And if you add this kind of things, it can encourage the network to learn high frequency functions, basically try to learn something that's very high frequency and non-smooth. And, and we actually try that if we use this positional encoding and with our Lipschitz organization, we will not be able to get a smooth solution. And that is because when you want to do this kind of positional encoding, you already want the network to learn something that's high frequency, which is kind of completely opposite to getting a smooth solution. So, so I think in this, so in this case, uh, simply uh, using our Lipschitz regression uh, will not give you a smooth solution. But I can tell you, if you if you think deeper, you will be able to figure out like an architectural change that can still use positional encoding, but but make sure. Uh, the change in the latent code to be smooth. Yeah, so this actually brings me to the question of, yeah, there's like, so, so you use the traditional value activation or soft class activation based networks, but there's mm. this new line of work of sirens, right? The sinusoidal mm. activation based networks. So what you're saying is that this regularization will not work for sirens out of the box? I, I was, it will not, it will, this will not work for us because those uh, siren thing, it, I personally, I just think that it is more like you are doing something in the frequency space. But even like uh, I know, if you think about like the do Fourier transform and look at those uh, frequency values, even the frequency values look, look the same. But but there are some, but the high frequency component, the small difference will will change a lot. I would say if you use this kind of siren, this type of approach, because you are already work on I guess, like high frequency domain. So even if you're function is, is smooth kind of in the frequency domain it doesn't mean that it's smooth in the spatial domain so so i, I would say like what well, if we really want to um make use siren but still want to use the Lipschitz thing to encourage for example the interpolation to be smooth like one possible idea is you can have for example like a two branches of your network you can there's one taking those xyz coordinate and map some function and the other network for example take the latent codes and map to something and then you can merge them together in some way in this way that you can make sure that your change in the in the latent code will not result in a, 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 a like a abrupt change because like the latent code network is kind of lips just smooth but you can still leave the siren network there to do uh what they want to do like basically so learning some high frequency features yeah so so like kind of changing the architecture to disentangle between the latent code and yeah. the spatial coordinates in this way, you still maintain latent the space. smoothness in the latent space, but then you allow the frequency space to, to be as crazy as it needs to be. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Did you get any unexpected findings, any unexpected results? Yeah, I think there are one, uh, uh, I would say one detail that bugs me, that bothers me a lot when, when doing this project, because back then when we just, Okay, which when we just train this kind of uh, ML, MLP with that L2 regularization and then with our Lipschitz regularization, actually, if you if you um, if you just train it, you can you can make sure these two things are are they, they, as I mentioned earlier, they will both encourage a way to be very very small. And I think one unexpected finding is that back then I just said okay. 
are we inventing something useless because they both can make the waste more than what's the difference? But actually, when I stuck on that and I, 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 I do more uh, experiment on that, I actually noticed that, I noticed the conclusion I mentioned earlier is that even if you're waste small, the Lipschitz concept of the network can still be large. It means that the network function can still be not very smooth. So, so we actually notice that like the key difference of this compared to those traditional regularizations that we can we penalize the thing we want to penalize. We penalize the smoothness of the network instead of just making sure the weight is small, but it is unclear what's the relationship between a smaller weight and a smoother function. Because no one can tell you that like a smaller weight in terms especially the summation the small can guarantee you smoothness. You can still have for example, if I have, I don't know, the weights, let's say the weights just as A, B, C, three values, you can, if you say like the summation is 10, you could be like 0, 0, 10, you could be like, I know, 3, 3, 4, but 3, 3, 4 function is going to be small, smoother uh, than like a value with like very big uh, weights. So yeah, I think there are a lot of interesting finding there, but this is one of them. Yeah, interesting. Okay, moving on to the next section of the paper, conclusion and future work. So how do you see the impact of the paper going forward? And if you know of any interesting papers that followed it or future interesting projects thing that are left open, please share. Yeah, I, I would say I personally, I'm, I'm very excited about this kind of smoothness measure because you can know that like a smooth measure are like how useful a smoothness measure is to a lot of, especially graphics applications, like not necessarily like shape interpolation we show, but there are also a lot, of, a lot of other things. For example, you want to transfer function from one shape to another, you want the transfer map to be smooth. And I know in reconstruction, if you have some missing region, you also want this region to be smooth. I think there are many, many applications that wants a solution to be smooth. So, and we only explore a few of them, but I'm very, very excited to see like how this kind of smoothness measure can be used in other applications. And beyond like graphics, I, I also want to, I also interested in seeing like more MLP based application because MLP are basically used everywhere, not necessarily in machine learning in graphics, but I know in other medical fields or in vision and like everyone's using MLP. And I, I believe this is like a, just a general smooth suspension for MLP. So even if application beyond uh, graphics, I'm also interested to see how how it would happen. And another another follow up that's interesting, and you also briefly mentioned earlier, is that you the interpolation we get is more like a linear interpolation between the two shapes. But interpolation, there's there's already a lot of great papers showing that if you're doing optimal transport. Or what's like, or another term is called what's the distance, and this will give you like more, re, more I would say more reasonable or more visually appealing interpolation between two things, not just linear interpolation, and because it's actually aware the true distance of transporting a pile of mass to another pile of mass. So I'm also interested in in, in current smoothness, for example, in the space of optimal transport. I think that's also another thing that, that I'm very interested in. Cool. Okay. Yeah, it's super interesting, this this uh, future work direction. Any early career PhD students looking for your next project? Here you go. Okay. On to my favorite part of the podcast. What did reviewer two say? Please share some insightful comments that the reviewers had that made the paper better. Yeah, actually, I, I was very lucky with this project that the reviewer two, usually, which is the the most negative one does not give us a, a lot of like negative feedback on that. I think most of the reviewer appreciate the simplicity of a paper. They really like the, the fact that this could be implemented in like only a few lines of code. And they also love the evaluation we did in the paper by inventing, I don't know, four or five, six different baselines and then compare against them. I think they, they, they really like that we, we do like evaluation in terms comparing with a bunch of alternative techniques and and the simplicity of the code and most of the negative feedback is is mainly about uh having more results for example i, I remember at the first time we submitted we only have a couple 3d interpolation result but i think right now here's there are more results in the appendix and that's thanks for the reviewer suggestion on showing more results i think previously we are kind of limited by the page limit so we didn't include so many results but i think we reviewer do, does a great job of suggesting us to put, I think, two or three more pages of result in the appendix. So right now the, the paper is more fun to read because you have more results to, to, to check out. 
Yeah, I, I totally understand the you know where the reviewer is coming from. In 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 this fast paced field, there's the fear of oh, is this cherry picking or is it actually working, right? And the fact that you can provide more results basically answers that question. Well, no, it's not cherry picking. Use whatever two shapes you want, and you get a, and it's smooth. Uh, and yeah, that definitely made the paper better, uh, in my opinion. Like for me, for re- like reading it, I was just looking. Oh, I want another example, another example, and they're also satisfying to look at. And you see the the smoothness compared to you know the traditional one without the Lipschitz constraint. Um, it looks really nice. Thank you, thank you for the kind words. Okay, it's time to wrap up. So, Derek, thank you very much for being a part of this podcast. And until next time, let your papers do the talking. Thank you for listening. That's it for this episode of Talking Papers. Please subscribe to the podcast feed on your favorite podcast app. All links are available in this episode description and on the Talking Papers website. If you would like to be a guest on the podcast, sponsor it, or just share your thoughts with us, feel free to email talking.papers.podcast at gmail.com. Be sure to tune in every week for the latest episodes. And until then, let your papers do the talking.